welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. I'm here with Marion Kylie. She uh, is joining us from Cork uh, in Ireland. Uh, she uh, is a complexity enthusiast. Um, she's got a big interest in well-being. She started her, her own firm upstream five or six years ago and uh, you know, works as a, as a consultant as well as being a lecturer. <laughs> so Marion, welcome to the show. Good morning, Richard. How are you this morning? I'm very well. I'm very good. And the reason, yeah, the reason I, I, I got, kind of got in touch with you, you co-wrote and a chapter for the Kinevin at 21 book. And for those who yeah. are unfamiliar, Kinevin is a particular you know, framework and a way of uh, thinking about order and unordered systems and complexity in the world. Uh, so uh, I was drawn to you know the work you've done there, and your particularly your interest in well-being. Given this is the Being Human podcast, it seemed like a good fit. Um, so yeah, perhaps you. I don't know why didn't you? We start with a bit of your your background, and then how you got into this this topic of of complexity, and, and especially applying it to well-being. Very good. Um, yeah, well, Ellie Snowden and myself co-authored. We'll say we wrote that chapter between us. And um, I think it's fair to say we wrote about four chapters before we settled on the one we did. We went down so many rabbit holes, you know. But um, when I look at my entrance into complexity, um, I suppose it was kind of frustrations over the years. My background would be health and safety and looking to get stuff done and getting kind of tied up in bureaucracy, um, you know, within organisations. And I went on a week long masterclass in human factors and safety back in 2015 with Professor Sidney Decker and uh, RJ De Boer as well. And that was in Utrecht um, in the Netherlands. And that was an absolutely brilliant um, course um, masterclass for the week. And they mentioned Dave Snowden and the Kinevin framework during my week there. And being the student that I was, of course, I had to go away and do a bit more digging. So that December, then I went to London and met with Dave over there for another week-long masterclass on complexity and sense-making and um, the whole Kinevin framework. And it was just since then, I've just, I don't know, you kind of see the world a different way. You know, yeah. things begin to try, I, I don't know, they just begin to make sense. Um, in a way, it's a blessing. In another way, it's a curse because <laughs> you're just like, I, I don't know, you're like, it's, it's great to be able to kind of zoom up and out and see the bigger picture. And at times then it's like, sometimes you'd be saying, isn't, wouldn't ignorance be bliss? Like, you know, because you just get so kind of, I don't know, <laughs> frustrated with systems and stuff, you know. But, but since going on that, that course with Dave many moons ago, like, I don't know, I'm kind of part of the, the Kinevin family now, I suppose. And yeah. consider myself very fortunate um, to have travelled to Canada to one of the Kinevin retreats. And I encourage Dave then to come to the Iron Islands off the west coast of Ireland to have one of the retreats there. And um, I've actually worked now in, you know, co-delivering some of the, the Kinevin Foundations courses in Dublin and stuff as well. But there's a great community and it's yeah. just, it's great to be able to tap into people, you know, across the globe, no matter a project that you'd be working on, that there's expertise there. And there's, I, I just find myself like, um, I don't know, Gary Wong in particular, Steve McCrone, they're just great buddies that I can reach out to, you know, pick up the phone. And it's just like a case of absolutely jump in, help you, you know, and likewise, um, I'll do the same for them. But um, it's just been fascinating, some of the work that has come out of this and how people feel actually. I, I have found it to be a hard sell when you, because you're talking about working with stories. This is kind of at this, the, the, the central core of um, the sense making and trying to tap into it in a lot of the work that I do. So when I talk to organisations and I say, I'd love now to start working with stories, you know, I kind of get a, a sideways glance as in they think that we're going to be sitting around in a powwow and we're going to be all telling good old yarns. And, you know, and it's not that. But once like you get people on board and they try it, it's like they, they can't believe it because you're not selling snake oil. You're not coming in like you know, a preaching on this new way, you come in and help them to come together and make sense of what's happening for them. And stories are a great way of doing that. So you're more of a facilitator, really, but there is an art and a knack to that. And it's just what people can get out of it. It's truly amazing. And just to be a witness to that and see it is fantastic, rather than coming in with the slide deck 
and leaving at the end of the day with everybody cheering and going away and forgetting half of the following week. They they right. they remember the stories. There's a resonance there much deeper than and obviously you, you need the training side of things as well. I'm not dismissing that, but it's just from a sense making and a strategy perspective to bring your people together and work with those stories and make sense of them. It can really help, you know, in developing more resilient organizations. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? That you're contra- contrasting, you know, because you're a consultant, I'm a consultant. Those those two modes, right? The classic is the consultant's got the wisdom and they've been there and done it at other organizations and they've they've collected up all of this wisdom and they put it into PowerPoints and that, you know, they're showing you some uh, reveal about how you as an organization can turn yourself around if you just follow this particular method. That's yeah. the the paradigm really, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and to take that all away and come in and say, I'm here to help you uh, tell your story and yeah. to listen to others' story. <laughs> it's yeah. a real flip, isn't it? It can be because they're looking for the silver bullet solution. What is it? And it's like, I don't have it for you, but I will come in and I'll help you actually find out what's right for you, you know? And it's just, um, yeah, there's, there's so many out there who will take something that works in one organization and come to the next and the next and, the, and apply the same methodology. And, you know, if it's a, a process line and you're looking to try and up, you know, if it's something engineering wise or mechanical, that can be done. But when you're talking about people and systems, it's very, very different, very nuanced from one organization and even different pockets within the organization. You know, what will work in one department might work um, elsewhere. So you can talk the talk and come in and tell them that you'll sell them the, the sun, moon and stars and you're going to sort all their problems. But actually, um, to tell them that you can't do that up front and work with them to try and make sense of where they really are and try and influence the direction they're going in can be much more beneficial, you know. Right. And what do you find, you know, in your experience of working in this way, because there may be others, you know, thinking that they might want to start working more in this way. What, what have you found has been most important for you to develop as, as skills or perspectives to to allow you to operate in this way? I'm learning the whole time, you know. Um, I had a session there even earlier this year and it was Viv Reed actually. Viv is based in Australia and she was, um, like I've been doing complex facilitation for some time now and Viv got a group of us together and she was giving us some, uh, you know, um, going over, refreshing again on some of the complex facilitation skills. And even at that, I was like, I don't know if you're a Father Ted fan, but I was like Dougal looking at the screen as in, oh my God, like, you know what I mean? I'm guilty as charged. I've been doing what you say we're not supposed to do. <laughs> so you're learning the whole time. You know, it's, uh, yeah, you just have to, and I'm constantly, you know, and I, I think that's the point of it. Like the more you learn, the more you realise you don't know. And, and sometimes you can lose sight to give yourself kudos for how much you've actually taken on board because you become so nearly in awe of, um, the amount of stuff that you still have to explore uh, and try and get your head around, you know. But um, but I think just that, that curiosity skill set and being comfortable actually with making others uncomfortable, wow. which goes against the green um, a lot when you look at train the trainer and, you know, having people going out of your course happy. This is actually, when you're looking at complex facilitation, it's about upsetting expectations that people have that we'll all come along and we'll all agree on stuff. And, you know, it's very different. But really what you're trying to do is generate as much data as you can. And that will mean, I won't say upsetting people, but just not going with the current, um, what they, they might currently expect from the norm, we'll say, of, of um, workshops. And um, sometimes keep people get a bit flustered and they're like, you know, and it's like, just bear with us. You know what I mean? Uh, when we get to the end, it'll make sense. And that has been the feedback. We didn't know what you were up to at the start, but now we see it. It was fantastic, you know, but it can be quite a challenge because it's disruptive um, in, in how you actually facilitate the sessions, you know. Yeah. And it's, and it's as you said, you, do, you don't necessarily upset people, but it, it can happen, right? Because you're, you, you're opening up that, you know, Pandora's about, box, aren't you? And you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't know what's going to come out, right? No, and uh, it, it's about giving people permission at the end of the day. Like, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Now, as someone said once, but you could sprinkle a bit of salt in the oats. I thought that was a nice addition to that uh, saying, you know. But I just think, like, and I, I have been in some workshops um, whereby, I remember one in particular where we had a union guy who sat down 
the back of the room, he came in and just the non-verbals alone told me this guy did not want to be there, you know, and he sat separate. And I had somebody with me who wouldn't be a complexity person per se, um, who was just kind of helping. And they were like, do you want to come up here and join us? And, and I was like, in my own mind, I was like, you know, don't be making a scene of it. They will come at their own time if they want to. So um, I just said, look, it's up to yourself. If you'd like to stay there, stay there. Do you know what I mean? If anybody, people just want to sit back and listen to what's been said today, because it's only going to be yourselves talking, not us. We facilitate you with various methods, you know, but like just sit back and listen. That's probably one of the most important things you can do. You know, you don't actually have to engage as completely up to yourselves. But once you start, people are telling stories about their workplace. They're drawn in. So this guy came up and he was one of the biggest contributors to the day because he wanted to have his say, you know, and, and it's understandable. And it's, it's such a, a respectful approach in that um, regard, because I think a lot of the time people have. Um, you know, I won't say workshop fatigue, but like they're broad places, they're being sold, like this is the new way, go spread the word, and they get they become cynical and disillusioned. So it's very refreshing then to come along and actually be able to shape the day themselves, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And get what they want from it. it. It's very, very different. And um people are just, you know, if you talk about attractors and detractors, they're attracted to that kind of a setup, you know, and they yeah. learn um so much from it, like so. Yeah. But you're right about the workshop fatigue because there is, uh, yeah, it's a kind of um, a pattern, I suppose, in organizations that um, perhaps management will realize that people are, you know, say it's well-being, you know, are, are not doing as well as they'd like. You know, there's frustration. You pull people, you, you create some workshops, you get their input, lots of post-its, lots of actions, and then nothing follows up, right? And then the, people go back to the same culture and 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 I think that contributes to the workshop fatigue is that you, people have just done so many of those exercises and the culture never changed. They kind of start to check yeah. out from them. So is there, is there anything different about the way you work that can, can make that different, make that experience for people different? Uh, look, it's a challenge and it depends on who you're talking to in an organization. And I get how people are cynical with that. And I get as well, with, when you're talking about well-being and psychosocial aspects of work, like this kind of comes under the realm of health and safety when you're looking at, um, you know, health and safety at work now, the psychosocial hazards come under that realm now as well. And it can be sometimes, and I've spoken to health and safety managers, and it is, it's something that they're not comfortable with. It's something that they shy away from. They would rather nearly let sleeping dogs lie, you know what I mean, rather than actually probe that space. So I can get from there. Um, I, I spoke with one client one time and he said, look, if I send out questionnaires, which is typically advocated as the way to go to try and find out what the stressors are in an organization, he said, if I send this out to 5,000 employees, I'm going to get 5,000 problems back and suggestions and I don't have the time for that. You know, so I can get why there's a reluctance, you know. Um, and from... I've spoken, I've worked with health and safety managers as well who are in an organization, but they're not given the autonomy. They don't have the power to actually have, you know, impactful decisions. They're kind of presenting what comes out of workshops to the senior leadership teams who, when you meet them face to face, their intentions are good, but they have so many things pulling at them. And when the outputs come from some of the workshops, they have other priorities and they just don't follow up. They don't see it as um, valuable, you know, and um, as, as important. And I, I don't know, I suppose when you look at the, the bigger side of things, you look at KPIs, what's important right now? You know, um, how is this person's, person's success measured? And this is where the emphasis is, do you know what I mean? And if it's on, I don't know, depending on public or private sector, if it's on shareholder value and productivity and expanding markets, that's where the priority is, not so much so on the well-being. But I think we're seeing in the last year the impact of poor well-being on people, you know, can be detrimental to businesses as well. So it's trying to get, um, I, I can see it having a big difference and I can see when you tap in and work with stories. And I think, Richard, you've worked with SenseMaker in the past as well, yes. which is uh, you know, and when you look at that software, you can deploy that and it asks people to share experiences. And then we actually look and we look for patterns in that uh, in relation to where there might be stressors in the organisation. So this has been done with a well-being pulse. And I know one of the, the captures we've done 
like what shows up as stuff via stories that you don't normally get with your surveys with leading questions with questions that are important to be to me we'll say as um the person issuing the survey but they might necessarily be important to the people filling in the survey so with SenseMaker, you're getting their experiences but what i find encouraging for managers is that they are actually getting to see the donut and not just the hole they're actually getting to see what's working well as well as where there's rooms to improve you know right. so in that regard it can be very encouraging and you can say right what are this crew here doing because there's great stories coming out of here can they share something across the organization you know that will benefit others just you know I mean can we adopt some of those um practices or, or you know the means in which they work um and as well then when you find areas to improve it's about kind of exploring that but you know exactly where to go um now because you have the stories as well as um the the bigger data as well you know so it's it's appealing but it can be sometimes people would rather bury their head in the sand rather than actually um dig deeper and i think there's a bigger problem there as well in relation to the times we're in you know it's very i just know it's neoliberal that there's no appetite for regulation it's actually for deregulation so when we look at psychosocial hazards in the workplace um you know i have asked for um some of the stats in relation to prohibition notices you know um that would have come in because of that or improvement notices and there aren't any so even though it's a legal requirement, it's not being regulated. You know what well, I mean? What so you, sorry, what do you mean by prohibition notices? Sorry, that's here in Ireland. We'll say our, um, our regulator here is it's the HSA. They're the equivalent to the HSE in the UK. Okay. So if, if somebody doesn't identify if they have chemical hazards in the workplace, okay. they don't have proper risk assessments, they'll get a warning. Do you know what I mean? And like, we'll mm. come back in X amount of time and you, you must improve that. Or actually, if, you, if it's really bad, actually... You might, they might, the business might be closed until it's rectified. And this happens with biological agents and chemical agents, and physical, you know, a lot. But when it comes to psychosocial, and I stand corrected, and I'd love to see some more information on this, but when I did um, pry some time ago, there wasn't any information on that. So even though it's the biggest strain on our businesses and actually on our society, the psychosocial stressors and people not being able to cope and being out of work ill, having a negative effect on the workplace, on their families, on their communities, and society at large, and taking a huge amount out of the GDP. I don't know, is it four percent or something? It's estimated at. We just bury our heads in the sand and we don't tackle it. So mm. there's lots of little small actions happening, like nice things. You know, there's a code of practice introduced in Ireland now this year. You know, the right to disconnect, um, which is nice. It's it's a code of practice, but it's not a legal requirement in relation to that. But it's it's a stepping stone. So you'd be hoping to see. Um, more kind of developments on that side of things because I think until such time is actually it's like anything um, if you look at chemical regulations or biological agents regulations until such time as it was regulated people will play the system you know and they will they'll stretch the system and they'll find workarounds so you need to have some bit of accountability you would hope people would do it for the right reason and there's many workplaces who are doing some really good work here but for many others, I think you need to have that piece whereby it's actually on the agenda and you know you're going to be checked on it. And that will actually help with bringing about improvements. And yeah. it, I think it's in everyone's interest, but it's just, I don't know. I, you know, you know, even for myself and Ellie were writing that chapter, we looked, um, you know, we were looking at the whole epistemic justice and just the way um, organisations are gone. And you see it a lot with health and safety in relation to something goes wrong and it comes back to the individual or human error or, you know, we go in with a very limited kind of a, you know, with our blinkers on looking at incidents and that, you know. Whereas actually, when you look at the system at large, there was an Oxfam report done in 2016 in the US showing that you had adults working in poultry packing lines wearing nappies. So this is five years ago. This is happening, you know, now, whereby there is an abuse of people working in our systems. And this goes back like generations do you know what i mean and it goes back many years um when you look at the foundations of that as to where that acceptance came to be it's not yeah. okay to have people wearing nappies because it takes too long for them to de-gown and gown up again when they go for a toilet break that's not okay and we see it in some of the bigger 
I don't want to name um, organisations, but some of the organisations that we order from a lot will say via post and that. <laughs> but uh, they're up, up in the media. You know, some of their workers are on food stamps in the US as well. You know, and um, their their leaders are making billions. And yet, yeah. it, it's, there's something radically wrong when this is okay. We celebrate um, this as success. We look at these billionaires like this is success. Um, is it? <laughs> to have people suffering on your watch in one regard, yeah. But like, I don't know. There's so much more that people could be giving back and helping to make healthier societies. And, um, you know, I, and I think the last year has brought a lot of that to the, the, the fore, hasn't it? It has, it has brimmed yeah. up between Black Lives Matter and, you know, and we can see Palestinian Lives Matter has come up recently. It's just, there's lots of questions around democracy now and what's been communicated and what people are aware of and seeing through some of the, um, um, I, I don't know what you'd, um, you'd call it, like, you know, but just putting a lot of smoke screens in front of things, like the, the fog is beginning to lift a little bit, you know, but um, we, we have a long way to go again. But um, yeah, anyway, I'm going off there, kind of down a... No, no, it's interesting. I never even conceived of health and safety, particularly in that way, as you say, the psychosocial, um, you know, it makes sense to me that you don't want people exposed to to chemicals in the workplace and i suppose that's always been my conception of health and safety but to think that uh we we might want to think about toxins in terms of psych a culture you know toxins in the culture and uh, people's mental health being affected by the culture in which they're operating that's that's a sort of whole new spin on health health and safety i've not ever really considered and you see a lot of the focus is when you talk about um well-being at work a lot of the focus comes in in the, the the whole like health promotion, you know, um, the secondary kind of intervention and the tertiary, which is giving employee assistance programs and giving counselling. So we'll give, as myself and Ellie were calling it, like yoga and yogurt or bikes and bananas. That, that's <laughs> what people jump to in relation to well-being. Or we'll give them a session of yoga and they'll be grander. We'll give them a mindfulness class and should they be grand after that. That's coming in to kind of help people deal with, and it, it's very beneficial, you know, um, I've done my master's on mindfulness-based interventions and I'm a big believer, but it's not for everybody. Yeah. And it's secondary. You know, we really should be going to primary. And if we were to draw a comparison between managing for psychosocial risk factors and actually first aid, you know, and people getting injured, we don't just, um, we try and prevent the cuts first. That's the first place you go. Yeah. So we need to start looking at the organisation of work and how we organise work and how that influences the well-being of the people in our organisation. Yeah, that's fascinating because, yeah, again, that's another of my conceptions you're, uh, you're challenging here because, yes, you can also think of health and safety, of course, in terms of physical accidents. And we, yeah. all, we all think about the building site and making sure, you know, builders don't, mm-hmm. you know, lose their arm in the cement mixer or whatever. But we, uh, yeah, again, we're not really, we don't, or certainly I don't, conceive it in that way of, well, what's upstream of the mental health issues that people might end up with? Yeah, And that's the whole upstream analogy. That's why I call my business upstream, ah, actually. there we go. <laughs> the, but there's an overlap with the public health analogy whereby somebody is at the side of, the, of a stream or a river and they see somebody floating by and they pull them out and they rescue them. And then they see somebody else and they rescue them and somebody else. They're so busy pulling people out of the river, they don't get to see who's pushing them in, you know, yeah. upstream. So and it's that analogy. Why is it that people are ending up out of work? Why have we, I think on average is a 30,000 euro is paid on, spent on training employees. So if you have a high turnover, it's undesirable. Do you know what I mean? You've invested a lot of money. Why can't you retain your people? You know, when they're actually out for some time and they come back, are we having, you know, back to work interviews? I know my, I would have been out of work previously. Um, I, I went through burnout many moons ago. And um, coming back to work, there wasn't a back to work interview when I co- insisted on one. But like how many organisations out there don't have these or don't take them seriously or aren't actually looking for the real learnings here? Because right. if we really want to hold on to our people, we need to find out, was it something in how work is organised that led to you being out of this workplace for six months? Because... There was a huge negative ripple effect out of that. We were trying to cover your job, retrain others. There was overtime expenses. 
there was like the whole sluggish side of things for the first few weeks. Like, will she be back? Won't she be back? But that's only one case. How many cases are out there? This costs a huge amount of money. It's not nice for anybody, for any of the managers in the system, HR, production, or for the individual going through it. And yet it's happening wholesale. There is so much of it. And the unwritten rule in some companies actually is um, rather than actually improve how work is organised to, you know, manageable workloads and giving people autonomy and all that good stuff. They wait until people are burnt out. They wait until they go out sick and they pay them off before it goes to legal action, you know. And it's like, imagine having that as your strategy. You know, it's just, and and, and it, it happens, it's out there. Um, and I don't know, I think after this past year with COVID, um, I don't know, just talking to various people, there's lots of people out there struggling, you know, and kind of suffering, but thinking they're the only ones. But actually, there's a collective uh, suffering going on. And I think once things open up again and people can actually go on their two weeks holidays and they come back and they realise they're still not sorted, they're still wrecked, they're still, you know, again, we have legislation in Ireland here, we have the Working Time Act, you know, whereby you're supposed to work a limited amount of hours per week or a certain hour. But I know in some industries, I have friends working in example for in the financial industry, and that's neither here nor there. I might as well be reading out an Enid Blyton to them rather than the Working at Times Act. Do you know what I mean? Um, it's just not adhered to. So again, it's just the regulation of that because people aren't robots, they're not machines. And... Um, yeah, I think we're probably taking it a bit too far in our expectations. And um, when you look at what's happening, I know in um, New Zealand, um, there is work going on there and it has been trialled on the four day work week in some organisations. Yeah. And that is becoming more popular now. What I think um, is it Nicola Sturgeon, the, the Scottish Prime Minister? I think yeah. she has mentioned if she got re-elected, she would be looking at the four-day work week. It would be interesting to watch that space and see what comes of it. But again, um, I think it's Andrew Barnes is the guy who's heading that up in New Zealand. And he's done, um, he gives some great examples how in his business, how productivity went up and the business improved so much. Yeah, by going to yeah there's been so week. many examples now of that yeah. counterintuitive finding that yeah, yeah. productivity goes up. My, my, brother's, my brother's actually his firm, which is a, um, I won't name the firm, but it's a, uh, it, it, let's say a, a pretty pure expression of capitalism and a firm that you might not expect to do this, but for the entire summer, everybody gets Friday off. Yeah. Brilliant. They are very successful, you know, commercially very aggressive firm. So, yeah. And you see, it's, it's kind of self-propelling because people want it and they will work for the four days a week. They'll work their socks off to make sure they get the three yeah. days off. And to have three days off, like, because when you think of it, once upon a time, people thought a 40 hour work week was like out of the question, you know, because people yeah. were working six days a week and they were working 10 and 12 hour shifts. So to bring it back to 40, people thought was it was just beyond their imagination that this could actually come to be. And now it is. So, yeah, liberal lunacy. <laughs> yeah. And I just think like, yeah, maybe we need a rethink here. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And have another paradigm shift um, in relation yeah. to the working hours. Um, yeah, and I think depending, you'll have the horses for courses. Some people will rather, you know, um, you'll see it now with the future of work. Some people want to come back to work. Some will want to be at home. Some will want a hybrid. Four day work week would be would appeal to many people, you know, to have that downtime and that rec- recreational time for family. Um, you know, so yeah, it's, and I try and do it. I'm not successful every week, but in my own life, um, yeah. I mean, because I work, you know, you know, don't have like a regular job. I have to, it's more like taking, you know, finishing at two or three on a day, you know, and over the course of a week, probably aim to work four days, not five. Yeah. Yeah. uh, And uh, I think it's nearly always easier if you're working for somebody else. When you work for yourself, it can be quite difficult. (laughs) Even to take two days off a week can be, you nearly have to be regimental and set your boundaries. And um, yeah. Yeah. Try our best. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that's coming to me as you as you talk as well is um you know, and this comes up a lot when you think about complexity, is the metaphors that we choose because the you know, we we sort of make meaning in the world through our choice of metaphors. Mm. And you were talking about, you know, treating people like robots machines. And I think li- literally and you know, firms do that, right? I mean they because the metaphor is that of a 
a machine and you might expect certain parts of the machine to break down from time to time. And, you know, that's just part of maintaining the machine, right? You know, a few, few yeah. cogs are going to, you know, snap or whatever. And the, me- the metaphor switch that I've, I've been in the, you know, in the progress is it was sort of work in progress in a sense, you know, moving towards the complexity is this one of more of the ecosystem or the garden or the, the, you know, the natural environment. And that's, that's where we think of the world and of businesses. And then of course it makes much more sense to be checking in with the ecosystem, right? Maintaining the garden, doing the work um, before you get a problem. Right. And that the idea of tending and nurturing uh, as a metaphor for, for the organization would lead you to want to do things like a, a sense maker survey where you ask people to tell you their stories of how they're finding the environment or uh, anecdote circles, which you talk about in your chapter of the book, where you get people together and, and share stories directly with each other. Like mm-hmm. that, that makes so much more sense if you're in that paradigm and you're using those metaphors. Yep. Does that, yeah, does that, does that sort does. of resonate? It does. And what springs to mind, actually, um, when we were on the Kinevan retreat out on the Iron Islands, one of the faculty was um, Yanis Gabriel, and he does a lot of work around narrative ecologies. And he talks about um, how you might want the equivalent of a wild garden where you don't want to tend to it too much. And then you might want a kind of a classical, like manicured French style garden, you know, and then you might want and like, but there's different, and that's the nuances even within the organization. Do you know what I mean? Whereby sometimes yeah. you want the ordered stuff and sometimes you want it wild and see what will come out of it. But I personally think, um, I think a lot of the business leaders, when we talk like this, like just expect us to really come up with daisy chains and start singing Kumbaya or something when we start talking about stories. I don't, don't think they kind of get it. Do you know what I mean? It can sound... I think how we convey the importance of it and what it can deliver from a bottom dollar perspective, as well as actually improving, you know, finding out what's really happening and tapping into the challenges that people are facing, what's helping or hindering them and getting their work done. If we can actually take action on that, and we're not talking about big change programs, we're talking about small local actions. And if they can see the benefits of that and how it actually affects the bottom line here, you know, and makes their business more successful, whereby customer experience is improved, product turnaround, like, you know, if you're looking at um, novelty coming in, you know, um, and innovation, there's lots of good stuff can come out of it. But it's just um, how it's communicated, I think, um, is the way to go. Not to be afraid, really. That curiosity is the way to go, and it's given them an advantage over their competitors um, because you can stick your head in the sand, but if you don't know what's happening... You'll find out, but it'll be too late. It'll be a missed opportunity. Yeah. Is, uh, you know. And that's right. And I think that, you know, time and time again, we <laughs> see, I mean, con- no worries. So, Raj Sodia came on the show and he was an author of the book, Conscious Capitalism. And he, they did quite a big study on uh, what they described as con- conscious firms or, you know, firms that, that, that um, attended to people's well-being, right? You know, that they, their employees were uh, as important as stakeholders as anyone else. And uh, the, the, the performance was extraordinary, right, I mean, compared to other firms. And there's been many studies that have, have, have borne this out. I suppose, I, and I had this debate with, with another uh, sort of guest on this podcast about, as you say, do you, so for people who are, let's say, in paradigm A, you know, where it's bottom line driven machine metaphor, you might want to try to bring them over by using their language and saying, you know, this is going to improve your bottom line. You know, this is going to mean that you can uh, outcompete your competitors and so on. But I do think ultimately that strategy is unsustainable because unless they ultimately make the flip to the, the different, if you like, suite of metaphors or the different paradigm, um, they'll always be pulling against it. That, that's, my, that's, yeah. that's my intuition with that. And that's it. Like, and it goes back to earlier on the sources for courses, or mm. sorry, and <laughs> using the horse analogies, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make him drink or put a bit of salt in. But it's like it's down to people. And as much as you and I would love to actually encourage people to take action on this, some people just don't have the interest, and they will um, just go a bit too far and work people to the bone, literally. And um, that that's a reality. Um, that's out there, unfortunately, you know, but thankfully there's plenty of organizations out there who are doing 
you know, um, great work in this space and they are finding out and they are instilling, you know, working with their people to make their organisations more resilient. And it's it's paying all around, you know, in the well-being side of things, but in the business side of things as well. So. Yeah. Well, so just to cut so just then to <laughs> potentially cut across what I've just said, the the story in the book is of a local council and where you know using these anecdote circles you know potentially led to some experiments i just wondered whether it's that story or any others where you've you know experienced a real tangible breakthrough in working in this way that you could share um i'm just thinking of that example and um in this actually i remember meeting with the leadership team in advance saying look this day is great and i'd encourage many of you to be there if you want but I would encourage you not to go ahead with it if you're not willing to take action. And if you're not, that's fine. But if you are, there's great potential for um, improvements to come about, you know, from this, like, you know. And they were like, absolutely, no, no, we're 100%, we're on board. It's, you know, definitely. So we went ahead, we had our day. There was no leaders at us. The health and safety manager was there with um, some of the crew. They had a great day. And I, on a follow-up debrief, one of the... Um, more senior people who was in attendance came and she said, I'm in the organization 26 years. And she said, that was one of the best. She said, actually, no, she said, it was the best, you know, day I have ever spent. She said, I learned more because I was paired with um, somebody who was only in the organization a very short period of time. I said, from seeing it through their eyes and what they have experienced, it was actually so interesting, you know, because we met people, um, we had the guys who were out going around to the various estates and, the, you know, um, doing their work and they'd be talking to the crew in the office. They thought the crew in the office were just like, you know, swinging around, freaking having tea, cups of tea and answering phones and they didn't have much to do. The crew in the office thought the lads outside actually were eating, I don't know, sausage rolls and <laughs> drinking coffee in the cars going around without having much to do. When they actually met, they realised actually we have a lot more common than we realised, you know. So this was all really good and they had a great day and there was lots of good outputs from it. But even though we had that session with the leadership team in advance, the action, the appetite wasn't there to actually follow up on the, some of the actions coming out of that. So that is something that I have learned that there needs to be some bit of prep with the leadership team to, to, for them to see the benefits in this. Um, it's not just like the crew going away for a day and coming back. Like some of the stuff that they wanted, like when you say, um, what is it that's important to people? They wanted to bring back once a month the, the Friday um, tea and cake session to wherever we catch up for an hour or two on a Friday afternoon. They wanted to bring that back. So, like, this is a safe to fail experiment. <laughs> you know I mean? Let's try it and see. But, and that's why I'm bringing back to the lean side of things. We're gone so lean that we're forgetting actually this is where a lot of the information is exchanged, you know, yeah. in these kind of informal um, settings, you know. But um, yeah, it's it's um, you know you there are successes and there's also opportunities to learn as well. And in that one, I just thought it was a pity that action wasn't taken, you know, um, with the outputs that were there from the day. Like a very um, committed um, safety manager who's trying to do um, follow up on, on what has come out, but just the fact that the the leadership team just weren't that engaged, and unfortunately, you get that. Um, Sometimes, do you know what I mean, with these programs, when that buy-in isn't there for, from the senior group. Yeah, I did. I did some work similarly with an organisation, and um, you know, we did a bunch of work. We came up with it with a whole range of ideas. Some of them were more technical and operational. Some were just more sort of fun. You know, one idea was like bring your dog t to work day, and you know, there was there was a whole yeah. range of ideas. But some of them was like you know, change the review process. This was a tech company on you know the code. Um, submission process and and what was interesting was that one of the most senior managers who were ultimately sort of sponsoring it and paying for it um, a lot of the ideas that came out weren't inside his range of what were going to be acceptable interventions you know they weren't directly <laughs> enough aligned to what he wanted for the organization so uh, yeah I didn't yeah I think the majority of the actions that came out of that workshop never got followed up on um, because there wasn't really that senior support. And so I think this is a really important point. You, this is great at generating bottom-up ideas, and it's great at this way of working and tapping into the intelligence of the, you know, the system and of, 
of people who are day to day facing, you know, operational challenges or well-being challenges, or whatever they might be. But it's all for now. If you can't get the the, the leadership right, because we're still dealing generally with hierarchical organisations. So if you oh. haven't got that leadership there and in a place to run with it, even if they might feel uncomfortable. Back to your earlier point that some of these ideas, like bring your dog to work, they they could see no tangible benefit to their organisation from doing it. Unless yeah. you've got them in a place where they can kind of suspend judgment, it's yeah. it's hard to get these kind of initiatives to have traction, I'm, I find. Yeah, it is. And some of them, like I remember another group, um, they were looking for a popcorn machine. You know, like they're not biggies. And when you look at some of the bigger change programs and what they cost, what's the worst that can happen? It's ensuring that it's a safe popcorn machine and the instructions are, you know, like that you're not introducing new hazards. But like for, for the most part, like, is that going to yeah. make or break the organization, you know, and actually just try it and see. And if it works out, great. And if it doesn't, you know what? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. But what I do find a lot is that connection piece that comes up quite a lot, um, whereby organizations would have had this annual day together, whereby the leaders might have cooked steaks, you know what I mean? And served the employees like at barbecues right. and stuff. But due to cost cutting or you know, it's been seen or been in the local press as an extravagance, they stopped doing it. But actually, it's just like this kind of a, a rotten apple kind of thing can set in, whereby you just end up with a very cynical and, um, I don't know, this kind of a learned helplessness nearly in your employees mm. because of that. They just become, over time, they don't feel valued and respected. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it, it's that stuff, that social reciprocity piece. Do you know what I mean? I'm here to serve you and thank you. Just that yes. recognition piece means a lot to people. And we underestimate yes. it um, sometimes, you know. And um, yeah, and it's, it's just our systems as well. Like we talk about health and safety and how things are organized. But even in the structure of our work, how do we promote people? You know, what is the process around that? Is it fair? I have worked in organizations whereby some really, really good employees, I'm talking very innovative, like save the company millions with some, um, you know, innovations that they had come up with. And just to see them coming into work then with this learned helplessness and just this like so disillusioned and cynical because their face didn't fit. And the guy who wasn't that great a worker and wouldn't have been missed off the floor was promoted. And people who would have been off doing courses and um, worked their socks off over the years wouldn't have gotten it. You just get this like cynicism coming in. And then when it comes to the point whereby management are looking for that extra something we all need to come in here. We all need to do this and trust. It just goes out the window, falls in their ears. And, and that's the power of story. Do you know, people don't forget things either. You know what I mean? And you get reminded of that. And it really does shape, um, you know, our organizations. So you can come in with the best program and it can be really, really good. But if there is an ele- the element of mistrust so much so that people are just, it's a real them and us and they have been burned too many times. They just won't go there because of the power of the past and that narrative that keeps coming with them, you know. Um, yeah, so it's just, yeah, it's powerful and it, it really shouldn't be underestimated, you know. And but, no. but we can change those stories and we can shift them, but that comes through action, not through talk. Yeah. And um, actually, there's a really good example of that. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the NHS Mersey Care. No. Um, a change program that they brought in. So they brought in a just and learning culture. So they went to um, introduce this. And it started with their their top guy, the senior leader, Joe Rafferty, actually coming out and saying, I got this wrong. We got this wrong. You know, we were actually st- stringently sticking here to HR policies whereby we punished our employees if there was an investigation. The intention wasn't to punish, it was to find out, you know, when we look at what was written down, what really happened here in patient care. But actually our employees were really suffering and we've realised we've got this wrong. We're putting our hands up. We need to change it. We can change it without you. But the change that has come out of that organisation because of that humble leadership and Ed Shine and Peter Shine have written a book on that. But some of the people who were so frustrated that there's actually a movie on this on YouTube called um, Just... Yeah, Just Culture, the movie. But um, there's a lady in Amsterdam, or in the Netherlands, Manat Kaur, who done some research into this. 
And conservatively, they saved £1.8 million per year by shifting from this blame culture to a just and learning culture where it was more holistic. And But it took the senior leadership to actually put their hands up and say, we got it wrong. Right. So With just, that comes, yeah. Go on. Sorry, what were you going to say? Yeah, no, because it's, and that's the whole just culture piece because lots of organisations say that they have a just culture, you know, but it's, um, it's a retributive just culture. Um, whereas Sidney Decker, that guy I mentioned earlier on that I'd done the course with uh, many moons ago, he has written a lot on a restorative just culture, you know. So this is actually right. about who decides who's done right or wrong. And in many organisations, your employees don't get a say on who judges that. And it very rarely is somebody who's a neutral bystander right. who can come in and look at this. It's probably somebody with a management hat on who's biased in their role in deciding this. And a lot of the times it's punishment that's dished out. And we lose an opportunity here to learn from what's working and what's not working, you know. Um, and people just don't end up sharing information. They end up um, climbing up. So, um, but it's, it, it's a really, really good example of showing the benefits here of um, really looking at what's not working, you know, and, and I think a lot of our organisations have gotten caught up in the, the bureaucracy and the policies and the procedures, and we need all that stuff. But when they become so rigid, that they overly constrain us. And I think COVID has shown us that in relation to people and flexi work and being able to do their work from home. They have exceeded expectations, actually. So a lot of those HR policies that were like written in stone and they couldn't be changed. Do you know what I mean? They're yesterday's news. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. You know. How many of those are going to be ripped up? Yeah, you must be in the office five days a week. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. And but it just yeah. reminds me of another. Go on, sorry. No, but I think the more examples we have of that, but that takes courage. And I take my hat off to Joe Rafferty. I think he's, he's fantastic himself and the HR director there, Amanda Oates, they've done some fantastic work. So, um, but I think we need more examples of that. And it's great to see um, companies openly willing to share that experience with others to show, um, you know, how hard it was actually for the various uh, people in that to shift and to be so honest with their suffering because it's happening in many organisations. We just don't, share it for, I don't know, legal reasons or whatever reasons that people are very, you know, tight with their, um, and safe with their information, you know? Yeah. The, the, I think the suffering point is important. Um, in his book, Gary Hamill, his, his recent book, Humanocracy, he's got this term, which I love the idea of the recovering bureaucrat, right? <laughs> that we, we, you know, we have to play all of these antisocial games to survive and get on in a, in a bureaucracy. Um, and the first step to shifting culture is to sort of accept, our, accept like, like we're in an AA region, right? you know, I am a recovering bureaucrat. Yeah, and in fairness, like it's just... And, and, and make yeah. a fearless moral inventory of our uh, sins yeah. against co our colleagues in, in the bureaucracy, yeah. Yeah, and it's like, and this when you look back on it, like, you know, um, like go back, I suppose, to the start of you know, the early 1900s and you look at the whole scientific management and the introduction there by Frederick Taylor, you know, and this kind of influences a lot of where we are today, you know, and these systems were brought in because when you think of it, we went from agriculture into like big industry and there wasn't shape nor make to it. It was just, you know, um, a bit all over the shop. So then we try to actually introduce some systems and processes and it was really good, you know what I mean, to have some bit of order on it. But like anything, the intentions of all these things are good and they start off as being good, but we take it too far. You know, when you look at health and safety legislation, like the first act in the UK, I think, was 1802. And we had children working um, shifts, do you know what I mean, in um, mills, and they were working night shifts um, at that time. So that legislation was brought in to prevent that from happening. Now, there are still children working night shifts and long shifts across the globe today. And we need to get some you know, harmony uh, globally in relation to if it's not acceptable here in Europe, you know, or in the UK, it, it shouldn't be acceptable anywhere else on the globe either. But I just think like when you look at the intentions, if you look at the 1974 Act in the UK, when that was introduced, you know, after the Robins report, really good. And if you look at the reduction in injuries and stuff that came was really good, but then we take it too far. 
And then we manipulate yeah. the numbers and it's all about a zeros game. And zero is the goal. And it's just like, I've been in workplaces where by there was fellas who would hurt. There was one fellow I remember, for example, who would hurt his knee. His knee was like a balloon. And he was told by the hospital he went to put the leg up for two weeks and he wasn't to budge, you know, rest and relax. So the company actually brought him in in a taxi so that he wouldn't be marked down as a missed day. Or they, if it went over three days, he would have to be reported to the regulator. This is happening wholesale. I was in the States there a couple of years back and I was chatting with one of the clients we were going out and just asked them something. I, I don't know how it came up in conversation. And basically it came out about that side of things and the manipulating of injuries. And he's like, yeah, we kind of, like the bonuses are tied into this kind of stuff, you see, <laughs> you know. Right. Um, and this is something that I wasn't aware of for a long time. But it is like um, a lot of the senior leadership, it's down to the less injuries you have, the better. So there's actually a game played then to keep these numbers down and to have as little or a few last days as you can get. But this guy gave me an example of where one of the workers got covered and came exposed to poison ivy. And when they took him for medical treatment, he wouldn't take the injection that would have sorted him on the spot because it would have gone down as medical um, injury. And that would have meant that they would have blemished the record. So he went away. He probably went away off his own bat and went home and I don't know that he waited a few days taking slower non-prescription medication or did he just go to his own doctor but not record it with the, the, the company. But there's a game here. We talk about health and safety, but how unhealthy is that? How unsafe is that? And yet our success is because we have the zero or because that number is as low as possible. So there's this whole ethics piece behind that. But these, all these systems started off from a really good place but they get taken too far. And the same with the bureaucracy. It started off, you know, um, from a good place, but was just taken too far. I mean, so bring it back. Yeah, because of course, it's, in some ways, the bureaucracy brought some fairness to these systems. You know, it was a way to minimise nepotism and yeah, other other problems in the workplace, right? Because it, it sort of provided a paper trail and provided justice at some level. But yeah, again, it's, it's now gone too far. And let's call a spade a spade. How many people have you spoken to about tenders, you know, or something? And they're like, well, we know who's getting that tender before it's even advertised. You know, that yes. decision is made. Now, we'll go through all this procedure and you'd all spend hours filling in the paperwork and go in. But Bob's your man. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? He's going to get the job. Yeah. So it's just like this happens a lot. And the same, we'll have the procedures around, you know, dignity at work and diversity and the right people for the job. And But the biases come in and, um, you know, it's, it's not a case of what you know, but who you know in many organisations, you know, not all. Yeah. I probably sound a bit cynical there, but... No, no, I think, I think, I think you're yeah. so right. And um, just reminds me of another story from um, another complexity thinker, Ralph Stacey. And I, I love this story. And this is about a hospital, again, in the UK, where they were dealing with a lot of falls of elderly people on the ward. And it had gotten to a level where, the, you know, the management thought this was you know, unacceptable. And, you know, too, too many of these people were then dying from these falls. And so we needed to do something about it. So, so they first, their first attempt was you know, the, the classic attempt, right? Okay, let's Let's, let's identify all the places where we've got problems in our processes and how we're operating. Um, let's come up with uh, remedies for all of those. Let's put it into a plan. Let's get some targets. Let's put, do some training. And they, they enacted this uh, program. And then initially, they, they did see an improvement and the, the number of falls dropped. And after a while, I think several years, they'd gone back to where they were beforehand as if the whole thing had never happened. And so they tried a second time, and this time it, it, it's so simple. They just took one midwife who was particularly uh, skilled in facilitation, and they had her, uh, not midwife, sorry, not midwife, um, matron, I mean matron, and had her host, well, I suppose what you would describe as anecdotal circles, but basically circles where people would share each other yeah. uh, with each other, you know, how they were working. Uh, so she then had a full time role doing this across all of the wards. Uh, and what this enabled was nurses to process their shame. So all of the things that they knew they were doing that contributed to these falls, but they could never tell anyone, they could now share in a circle and others could share the same. And by getting it all out in the open then, it, it just created a new grounding for a shift in behavior. Oh. Um, 
in a way that trying to follow a management plan doesn't allow for. And they found that not only was this approach more successful uh, at reducing the number of falls, they didn't have the same regression problem. Like they they permanently shifted the culture as a result of this of this uh, intervention. So it just yeah. it just seems to be another story in a similar vein. And look, there's so many examples of it, and you could even look at it like from an individual perspective as well. When you talk about the shame, there it's, it's the stuff that we can't talk about. It's like you can't say this stuff out loud. I was given a talk there recently for a hotel I was working with here, giving some sessions on minding the gap. They're about to open their doors again. And we've been through a rough year where people are, you know, some people have people with vulnerable conditions at home and they're members of the public now, you know, so it's just about trying to prepare them um, for going back and just have a bit of, I don't know, um, empathy for each other um, as they go. But it's just that shame piece, you know, because I had mentioned, I said, let's, I'm up a fortune away in the past year. I was coming in to see the hair has gone a bit grey. Do you know how many of you coming in today were just so hung up and half panicky or stressed, you know? And when we looked at it, there was mixed emotions. People are nervous about coming back. Some people are delighted. They're excited, you know, afraid. You know, when you tap into that, like, so it's just some of the shame that comes with that, like, you know, that I can't actually say that out loud. Some people have gone through woeful challenges in the past year, financial challenges, even relationship challenges, you know. But this is across the board. And yet we don't tend to talk about these things openly. And it's not about going up and broadcasting it for everyone. But with people you can trust, if you can be honest, you're kind of giving them permission as well. And that can be a stress reliever in itself, not to be holding all this like, I'm the only one. Like, how many billion people are there in the globe? And we think we're the only ones that actually have put up a bit of weight or have a bit of grey hair or are in a bit of financial debt or have marital problems or relationship issues. You know, it's, and it's just, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, we're very lacking in compassion for ourselves that we'd be very willing to give others, you know? So I think there's a real piece on that to kind of just be that little bit, insofar as we can, mindful and kinder to ourselves, you know, rather than so um, harsh and critical, I think really, you know? Yeah. 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 No, nice. it's, uh, that's another, that's another piece. And interesting, we, we had this in my last uh conversation uh with Sonia Blichlaut uh, from South Africa and yeah um you know you mentioned there the individual here right the, the importance of the individual being mindful and um you know I suppose each of us dealing with our own complex system which is you know our, our being and there's this tension right between the Dave Snowden view which is let's not focus too much on the individual it's about the system. It's not scalable to only focus on the on, on the individual. We need to understand what's happening across the piece and the environment uh, versus what you're saying, and which I resonate with, that, that so much of our ability to navigate complexity uh, and thrive in complexity is, is to do our own work, our, our self-work. And th- that is complex in its own right, you know, mm. and absolutely the system at large and tapping into... The, the masses, obviously, that is like hugely like powerful to, to be able to do that. But I just know from my own journey and actually tapping into some of the challenges and some of the stuff that would have caused stress for me, some of this stuff goes so way back, like, you know, and it's just um, when you do kind of un- uncover it and discover it, I suppose, it can, um, it can just blow you away to think, oh, my God, like for... The last 40 odd years I've been carrying this around as my narrative, my internal dialogue. And this has influenced every interaction I have had. But now the fact that I've actually, um, now that you become aware of it, it loosens its hold, you know. Because, and again, it's the power of stories, the stories that we were told as youngsters, the narratives that were in our families and our communities, hold, they hold huge power over our behaviours and how we interact um, in all aspects of life uh, and be that in our organizations as well you know so yeah there's a huge piece there um on that and um yeah i just try and encourage people to try and be as um as honest as they can with people they feel safe with um yeah but it's just look it's as you say that's a conversation for another day because that's so complex in and of itself you know um 
to go into to those nooks and crannies. And my grandmother used to have a saying, actually, there, there are corns for cakes and raisins for everything. And I just think that holds so true. She was from West Limerick, so raisins means reasons, you know, um, the way she'd pronounce it. But when you delve deep enough, there are reasons for everything, you know. Um, and um, there's a reason why someone is a bit off or there's a reason why someone is doing what they're doing. And if we look politically at the minute and what has played out there in the past few weeks in the Middle East, like you're just looking at the players here and saying, why, why is this and why is that? And there are reasons um, underneath that, you know, and it's trying to go back to the foundations of that. Like, and why do we have such, why do we have issues um, socially um, here today that are coming to the fore, like in the past year? What are the foundations for all of this? And I think Nora Bateson has a lot of work done on first generation and sex or second generation. You're looking at um, data and the narratives there, but this stuff is so deeply embedded and it goes back hundreds of years, like, you know, um, and it's just part of our being. It's like, it's part of our, our collective DNA. And this is what's accepted and what's not accepted. And you dare to challenge it. And when you do, then it's like, as I mentioned earlier, ignorance is bliss. You nearly want to go back rather than be aware of it, but you're aware of it. No, you can't unsee it. So it's like, ah. you know, so it's just, yeah, it is, um, that's life, isn't it? You know what I mean? It's like, you're constantly, um, I don't know, seeing things, learning things, being challenged. Um, coming across new de- ideas and concepts, joining the dots to its relevance, as you were saying earlier on, health and safety, well-being, but connecting that to society at large as well. You know, um, it's just I'm doing some work at the minute, actually, a big sense maker project with Limerick Suicide Watch. And that's around mental health. So kind of moving away from the workplace setting and more into the the public space, you know, and just actually looking at what is it um, what are people's experiences currently? Do you know what I mean? Because we've seen um, suicides and mental health challenges. Um, you in know, Limerick, uh, especially. In Limerick, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, I suppose, we've, um, our own parish at home was hit there um, in the past few months with a suicide. And it's just like we've had one in our family years ago as well. And it goes to the core in you. Do you know what I mean? And it just, it's just, it's so, so hard. Um, you know, when you when this kind of comes knocking on your door and there's so many questions that that you have and what if and it's just and I suppose forevermore the people who are left behind are left wondering about this you know and it's just if only we could have done you know or tapped in in advance so again to try and tap into the collective you know uh, we're using SenseMaker for that to tap into what is it you know um is it work is it you know is it employment is it education is it living conditions is it relations is it uh, we, we don't know. I mean, just ask open into questions. Let's see if we can delve in and use then the power of the story then to try and influence um, you know, um, local government to try and get some more funding and supports there for people in what they need. But we, we can't underestimate the effect our work has. And I suppose I like come in from the occupational setting. It's so interlinked and interwoven with oh. the effects across society. But the workplace is a fantastic platform to have people going home, not just the same way they came to work, but in a better way after coming to work. Because now you have the opportunity to actually educate and influence in relation to all that good health promotion stuff, but actually helping them navigate some of the challenges as well and take an action on some of those when we go back to the primary interventions. But that has a positive ripple effect in families and communities and society, as does the negative. So we can do some good here rather than actually seeing the negative um, influence as well. And if we're looking at people trying to keep down several jobs to keep afloat, and they're trying to maintain a family, and we're wondering then why there's antisocial behaviour issues coming down the line with youngsters who are just craving time with parents who haven't got the time to give them because they're frazzled and trying to keep a roof over their heads and bread and butter on the table. And it comes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs here, you know, not to lose sight of that, we can talk from our very privileged positions here, being able to work from home. But the research has shown, if you look, and this was done in the UK, at people who worked from home, those who had to go out and those who got exposed to COVID, like the wealthier you are um, means the closer you are and the more likely you are to be able to work from home. And the less well off you are is the more likely you will have to go out and work. 
So it's yeah. great to be able to sit in a government office or, you know, make these decisions that people will get. I think it was £100 a week in the UK at the time for people to stay at home. But they couldn't survive on 100 a week. So they were faced with decisions then. Do I go into the nursing home? Even though I have a bit of a sniffle or a cough here and I, you know, and technically I'm being told yeah. to stay at home. But I'm actually faced with getting evicted or my child not being able to do X, Y, or Z. So it's like we have to be reasonable here as well, you know. Um, but as I say, that there's a huge opportunity to positively influence um, our society via the workplace and um, taking small actions and not all huge interventions and those small things um, have potential to make a big difference, you know. Yeah, I think I think absolutely right. And it just it reminds me of when I first read Ricardo Semler's book, Maverick. I don't know if you've come across that. But that no. that, that was uh he he inherited a big industrial firm in Brazil from his father. Uh and he turned that in a very in from a yeah, traditional culture into trust based culture, small units, a lot of transparency, very open culture a nurturing culture and uh, which also empowered a lot of the employees, right? He taught them all financial skills and they all got to choose their own salaries having looked at the, oh. you know, the, the P and L and, you know, so just, it's very uh, um, way ahead of its time in terms of, you know, it's the culture. But one thing I found interesting in that story and what motivated me initially to sort of take, go much deeper into all this stuff is that he found that uh, all of the, this was a mainly a male environment and all of the wives kept coming to him and thanking him because they were experiencing much less domestic abuse as a result of the culture shift in the company. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's just a great illustration of the point you make. Yeah, the, the, that whole obliquity piece sometimes, you know, by actually maybe regulating the whole psychosocial hazards in the workplace may possibly, and I know this is like unknown unknowns because, you know, you, you can't, the cause and effect is, isn't clear, but it might result actually in less antisocial behavior orders been dished out to youngsters you know it might result in you know less strain on the mental health or actual or healthcare systems you know because yeah. the stress as well when we look at mental stress it manifests itself physiologically in our bodies so we tend to think of it as just some mental thing and we can't cope or we can't sleep or we can't make decisions you know or we're just frazzled but actually you can you know cardiovascular disease can build up because of, you know, if you're exposed to stress um, on a regular um, basis, you know, on a continued basis. So there has been some studies in relation to all sorts, do you know what I mean? And if you look at the behavioural um, impacts of that, be it drugs, be it alcohol, be it overeating, you know, that comes from stressors and that manifests itself then physiologically in the body as well. So by actually trying to tap into some of this stuff, upstream and tackle it at source, we can have a huge ripple effect positive coming out um, on our healthcare systems and across the board, you know, so it definitely is um, a win-win, but it's just to try and get our, um, our governments to see. You will always have some early adapters, some companies who just want to go out there and be the shining light, actually, you know, and be the great place to work. And um, they can see the benefits and it's great to see that happening. But there's plenty more. The majority need to be yanked with you. So. <laughs> they need the stick. <laughs> Carrot and the stick, I think, from the Carrot you know. And stick. Okay. Fair. They're not going to do it by themselves. No, in fairness, like, yeah. But, um, yeah, so it's just about trying to, I suppose, do what we can to encourage that because, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's strange times. I think we're at a crossroads. Uh, COVID has presented us you know, to kind of reflect on where our world was going. Um, and it's just to see where we are and what has happened. And are we going to go back to old ways? Or are we going to change? And it'll be interesting to see that um, play out. Do you know, and as I say, just looking at, you know, some of the stuff that has come up there over the past year, there seems to be a bit of a, a wind of change, I suppose, you know, um, in the air whereby it's a bit more unsettled um, and people are becoming a bit more um, vocal on things that they feel strongly on. But um, yeah, we just have to wait and watch that one play yeah, out. Yeah, well, 
Well, yeah, wait and watch, but also we can take action, each of us every day, right? And I Absolutely. think whether that's doing, and you know, I come again back to the self-work because thinking about, you know, your experiences and my experience with leaders not wanting to face the stories that may be prevalent in their organizations or not wanting to do anything about it when they do read them. A lot of that is down to, you know, them being stirred up, right, by that data and and not really wanting to deal with it, right? Because perhaps, you know, there's more work that they might need to do to be able to receive that information and act on it. Yeah. Um, and so I think when each of us, in you know, goes out and, you know, helps others to connect to their stories, helps others on the journey, helps, you know, helps organizations to uh, you know, recognize the goodness in each other. And, you know, all of that does actually change the world. I believe in it, right? It's like, yes, mm -hmm. let's wait and see. But we can each of us every day change the world in a tiny way, either by working on ourselves or helping those around us. Absolutely. I agree. And I think there needs to be a little bit of, um, I don't know, I suppose if you look at MBA programs or where our leaders, to be fair, where they go and they get taught the programs that they're taught on, from what I can gather, and I'm coming from a health and safety perspective, and I'm giving the example there, Joe Rafferty, you know, and the NHS Mercy Care, there's very little of that thought as in the benefits of it to our leaders before they come in, you know, and work their way up in their organisation. So I think to instill there the importance of this stuff and how good it is for business, but actually we're all human, you know, and at the end of the day, um, you know, you want to be able to sleep at night knowing you know, we've seen the cases there in France and is it Orange that, you know, where there was 32 suicides in that organization that their top person. Yeah. Uh, that was, uh, was that last year or the year before? There was actually, um, there was a criminal case um, where the director was found um, guilty. Um, but he had made the comment like through the, was it by the, the stairs or by the window? I'll get them out. And some people actually jumped out like and, and took their lives. You had 32 people. So it's like, that's not acceptable. And we need more, like, yeah, we just need more organizations and more governments actually saying this is not acceptable. And we're actually legislating for this, you know, and we'll be checking up on you. But we need to see that happening to stop some people taking it too far. Like any of our systems, some things will be taken too far. And yeah. um, there's too much suffering. There's too many families out there, you know, um, missing people there, you know, come Christmas or whatever people celebrate for their various um, religions or rituals, you know, there's empty seats at tables and yeah. um, a lot of that can be avoided, you know, um, by doing the right thing by people and by um, your business, you know, so. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a good note to end on. So thank yeah. you, Marion. This has been, you know, fabulous to get your perspectives and some of your real world experience i really appreciate it yeah no worries at all richard it was a pleasure thanks a million I'm sure we'll cross Thank paths you. again at some stage yeah all right well um, and we'll put some uh that we'll put a link to your to upstream in the yeah. in the description and it's maybe a link to that uh, just culture youtube video that sounds like an interesting yeah, one to point people there to. As well. is there That's anything it. else you would put anywhere else you'd point people to uh, you know interested in some of the themes we talked about today um i suppose that uh, the I, I, no. <laughs> no, I'm here caught for words, like, you know what I mean? Myself and Ellie have um, mentioned some stuff, all right, in our chapter. Um, you know, I think that book, the, the Kinevin oh, book, the is book, actually yes. quite good. We'll, we'll, we'll flash that up for people as well. The Kinevin, yes, it's very good. If people, yeah, if maybe have some familiarity with the concepts, if we want to understand more about how these ideas are used, uh, yes, yeah, great book, tons of examples. Yeah, there is, to be fair, like, so I'd, mm. I'd recommend that because um, it's not, I go into anecdote circles in our chapter. And um, I think some of the other lads mention in their chapters as well, various other um, complexity um, methods, do you know what I mean? And I think the, yeah. the, the, the wiki is there as well, the Kinevin um, um, wiki, do you know, where some of these methods are actually up there in open source as well for people to check out. And but, that's, um, it's, well, that's, they can find that through the Cognitive Edge website. I think so. Yeah, I think Kinevin yeah. wiki. I'm not sure what the exact link is now, to be honest with you. Okay. But um, these methods are just... Um, Ritual Descent is another really good one. The Future Backwards yeah, is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. great. And what comes out of that is just brilliant. And it, like we talk a lot about active listening, um, you know, and this kind of forces the active listening, but it kind of plays it a little bit, you know, so people enjoy it. But what you, yeah. the output you get is actually really good. As well, yeah. you know, it's rigorous testing of whatever suggestion has been put forward. Yeah. Yeah. And there's tons of, um, yeah, wealth of 
Yeah, great, yeah. great techniques. Another another source for is uh, liberating structures. I don't know how much uh, familiarity I've with that, but that's another suite of uh, facilitation techniques which I you know sometimes draw upon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you once again, Marion. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Likewise, Richard. Mind yourself. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Take care.